Rick has what I call scientific family values, in that he does this in a way that though it's competitive, it's also collaborative. And though it's rigorous, it's also friendly. And that has not only caused the breakthroughs, but it's elevated the, the level and the spirit of the field that he has led for decades. That's an important thing, the spirit of a field. Rick is unconditionally generous, and that generosity is not something that diminishes his science. It elevates his science, and it has elevated everybody's science in the field. It's almost like a Zen master. You know, he, he won't tell you what the answer is, but he leads you along to the point where you discover the answer yourself. Rick Aldridge, he has this mammoth sense of humor. It's very smart and it's present in, you know, all the time. There's the idea that someone can be the smartest person in the room. But with, with Rick, it's almost like he's running laps around everybody. I was born in Roswell, New Mexico, and everybody asked about aliens, but I didn't know anything about them. Mr. Grant was my ninth grade science teacher. He was a true rebel and didn't do anything the way he was supposed to. But what he did with us was he just really kind of insisted on us thinking about things. I really resonated with that. And it, I think, had more of an effect than any science teacher I ever had in, in sort of, of really doing research where you don't know the answers. You're not trying to just get something, but you're trying to to figure something out and and develop a way of measuring something that answers a question. And that's what we do in research. And it's uh, it was an early and fairly intense introduction to that that I really valued a lot. I was an undergraduate at the University of Arizona, but I got to Arizona and I, I decided that, you know, I was really interested in kind of animal behavior and ecology on the one hand and then the nervous system on the other hand. And I, I sort of chose my courses to decide between the two. And I decided that neuroscience was the, the kind of mechanistic, how does it work, physiological side of neuroscience was really interesting. So I applied to graduate schools for that and uh, I decided to go to Stanford it was great. I was in the, in the neuroscience program, which was, I believe, the first interdisciplinary, interdepartmental neuroscience graduate program anywhere. And it really worked that way. There was a good community of students there from real different backgrounds. I think the program was great. I had a lot of fun as a graduate student. And then went to Yale as a postdoc, and just as the patch clamping became really widely known. So it had been around for three or four years, and this was a technique that allowed you to put an electrode down on a cell and get a tight enough resistance between the glass of the electrode and the cell surface to measure single channel currents. My postdoc had done well, so I had a lot of offers to choose from. Stanford just kind of had a everybody in there together trying to do good science feel. I just remember coming out of the hotel in the morning to wait for the taxi to go into the department and just knowing it felt right. He works on ion channels, which are the fundamental units of electrical excitability in all biological systems, including us. Ion channels are amazing because they, they allow us to have electrical signaling uh, just from simple movement of ions through a pore, but it only works because it's extremely highly regulated. And it's regulated by exquisite binding and unbinding of ions to open and close these electrical pathways. Ion channels are important because your cells, virtually all the cells in your body, have to make electrical signals 
to work. There, we are electrical machines and we work on electricity. And the things that make the electricity in cells are the ion channels. They are the unique class of proteins that live in cell membranes that cause voltage changes across those membranes. There are many diseases in which these channels are the problem. And, and I'd say the most common genetic disease in the United States uh, is cystic fibrosis. It's a devastating disease of children. He likes to go for uh, deep mechanisms of, of biological problems, you know, ion channel related for the most part. Um, he's uncompromising in going after those things and also innovative in how he chooses the approach. During his career, he's, you know, there have been many examples of how he's taken a problem, applied a new approach to it, say single channel recording, and, you know, sort of resolve long standing questions in the field. Rick had, had numerous breakthroughs in that area in the, in the 90s and into the 2000s. And it was because of this combination of his artistic intuition, his creativity in experimental design, and his rigor in analysis and, and data collection that those, all those four things got together to make these another breakthrough and another breakthrough in our understanding of ion channel gating. He's worked his whole life to answer questions you know, as thoroughly and as rigorously you know, as possible and come up with fundamental answers that people had missed by not going really all the way down you know, into the, to the depths of how these ion channels work and answering you know, seemingly obscure questions and looking at things you know, just as rigorously po as possible based on principle and by spending his whole life looking really, really carefully at how these ion channels work, I think he's come to understand them more thoroughly than you know, anybody else has. And that's, from what I understand of what uh, Paul Berg and Arthur Kornberg did, that's the way they made their fundamental contributions to how nucleic acids work. Rick is the perfect choice for this award. His science is evident to all through his publications, through his awards, through his election to the National Academy. Uh, what many people don't know is his co contributions to the community. He has been a leader in everything he does. He inspires people to be better. He led the Biophysical Society as president. He led the Society of General Physiologists as president, made big contributions to both of those. He has changed the face of publishing for science in terms of focusing on how can we make science better, how can we support authors. And he's kind to everybody and goes out of his way to help all sci scientists, not just, not just those who might serve his own special interests. He's been a leader in his field. He's opened up new, uh, new areas of research over a lifetime career. He's successfully taught and mentored a large number of students and postdocs here. And you can just go through the list and see there are dozens who hold uh, faculty positions at premier institutions and are leading their own uh, fields. There's no question that you know, Stanford should be incredibly proud of, of somebody who, you know, he was educated here and then spent a good part of his career uh, having a lab and teaching here. And I think he exemplifies, you know, things that you want to see in a research scientist and teacher and mentor. I don't know how much, you know, more you could ask for uh, in, in terms of recognizing an alumnus.